our tape uh, thing here, so we're not doing reincarnation on this one. It'll be on the next tape that goes out, all right? And uh, as we send these lists around, if you're interested in ordering that, you can. But uh, we're doing tonight the Zodiac and the Bible, and we've come to the sign Cancer. And we're going to have some really an interesting time as we kind of break the bonds of all fears and superstitions about things like this, and we look at the sign Cancer. And here it is, and most of you look at it. In fact, if you want to look up here, say, this is mine. We've arrived at, at my sign, okay? Uh, there's an interesting thing about this, and there's an interesting thing as it involves the church that we, we have here. As you know, Joan does all of the counseling for our church. She is a registered nurse. She taught psychiatric nursing for Ocean County for 15 years. She designed the first uh, heart cardiac unit at Point Pleasant Hospital. She, uh, what else did you do? She used to take me up to Marlboro Hospital where she uh, affiliated and tried to leave me there, and I said no. And I wasn't half as bad as I am now. I mean, I was pretty straight in those days. But uh, <laughs> she does a great job, and uh, she has a lot of skills. She's very close to her degree in psychology, and she doesn't have it because she had to leave her nursing work to come here. We had a little more business here than she's had at uh, Marlboro, I guess, so she had to come here. But anyhow, the reason that I, I, I raise her up in this particular thing is because when you look at cancer, there in Greek, uh, there's a Porphyrus who said, therefore, two gates, there are two gates, cancer, and Capricorn. And this is very interesting to me and to the way this church operates because there I am and there's Joan, Cancer and Capricorn. And it says, therefore, two gates, Cancer and Capricorn, and quite appropriately, Joan, Plato called them two mouths. Two mouths. Do a lot of talking. <laughs> All right. But this is what is said. Of these two gates, now this is what's very interesting about that. Cancer is the gate through which souls descend. Descend. To me, that this gate is where one would drop into the deep realms of spirit. Capricorn is the gate by which they ascend and exchange material for a divine condition. In other words, and so many of you have seen that happen, you have come here, you have heard this word, you have read it in the Bible, you have heard the mysticism, you enter into meditation that I'm able to guide you in that way. When you see me then walk off this platform, you know I'm absolutely worthless. My spiritual expertise, if it's any, is bounded by these little things. Once I come off of here, I can do any, nothing. But You've seen that after maybe you have taken what I've been able to share with you out of mysticism and spirit and go to her, she is able to help you use these principles and raise yourself up out of the pits of the carnal condition that was oppressing you out of that into a divine condition. And that's really very exciting for both of us to see that this indeed, there is a tremendous ancient relationship of well, if you want to call it the two mouths or the two gates, that which descends down into the realms of deep spirit and then Capricorn, which brings you up and allows this divine touch to manifest in your life. It's a beautiful thing. The Arabic name, okay, for cancer, as you see it there, the Arabic name is Al-Sartan, S-A-R-T-A-N. S-A-R-T-A-N, and it means who holds, H-O-L-D-S. And of course, all you have to do is look at the picture of the sign, and you can see, you know, a, a crab does just exactly that. It hangs on. It holds, okay? The Greek is karkinos, K-A-R-K-I-N-O-S, which means holding. And in the word, in Latin, in, in Latin, the word cancer means holding. It holds on. And the crab holds on tight. Take a look at the, at the uh, sign, if you would. The constellation in the center of it, there's a bright cluster of stars called Presepe, P R A E S E P E. Do you see that right in the center? That means a multitude. 
a multitude. The brightest star, and you'll see that in the tail to the right side, is tergmine, T-E-R-G-M-I-N-E. And again, it means that same thing. It means holding on, holding on. Now, here we have some interesting things. If you look in the upper center of the uh, crab, you'll see the star Acellus boreus. Do you see that? Acellus boreus. That means the northern ass. The northern ass. Okay? And now if you look down to the, below the ecliptic, you see Acellus and Ocellus australis. Do you see A-U-S-T? That's the? There you go. That's the southern ass. The northern ass is uh, Ocellus boreus, and Ocellus australis is the southern ass. Now, do you see that line going right through there, the ecliptic? That's the pathway of the sun. The ecliptic means that's the pathway of the sun. That's where... That's where that constellation will, you know, the trajectory takes it right through the center where the sun moves through it. So what does this do? Every one of the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel in your Bible is defined by a zodiacal sign, all right? And this here, the northern ass and the southern ass, connects this cancer to the tribe of Issachar, I-S-S-A-C-H-E-R. And I'll show you how. If you look in the book of Genesis, in your Bible, on page 44, in those little Bibles, Genesis 49, verse 14. I'll show you something. Genesis 49 and verse 14. And now you'll, you'll see how Jacob, and this is how Jacob and the Bible names the, uh, uh, the, the, the 12 tribes after each of the signs of the zodiac. And this particular one, Genesis 49, verse 14, Ishakar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. You see it? Okay. And there is the identity of the tribe of Ishakar with the zodiacal sign Cancer. Jesus Christ of the tribe of Judah is Leo, which is the lion. And, and all of these different tribes are, are so associated. You know, it's a, it's a very amazing thing. Of course, contemporary Christianity is so feeble anymore that... You know, they're reduced to a Bible and, uh, you know, holding one another's hands. But in the ancient times, in the early churches, uh, the ceilings, of the, many of the ceilings of the, of the original Christian churches were decorated with the 12 signs of the zodiac. And in fact, uh, I guess it was Michelangelo who painted the Last Supper. Is that, would that be right? Or was that uh, Da Vinci? <laughs> da Vinci. Da Vinci was an astrologer. Da Vinci was an astrologer. And the Last Supper was painted by the signs of the Zodiac. And the eighth person from the left, which was the eighth sign, was Judas, which was Scorpio. And it was the sun, Jesus Christ, surrounded by the 12 signs. And the eighth from the left was Scorpio, Judas. And what's wrong with knowing that? It's not going to hurt you to know that. It's a fact. It's a fact. Okay. Now, anyhow, there you have the tribe of Ishakar. So what, would, what do we have if we take a look at this crab or this, this constellation? We have the crab holding on tightly to what? I'll tell you something. You look at me, and it's a perfect hold. I will do that. I will hang on by the throat, you know. <laughs> and, and what I do, and, and I have been, there's been many times in this ministry when many people would have run, and I was very tempted to, and then when I said, hey, I am, because, you know, people call you names and all this stuff happens and, you know, you're an outcast, you're a cult leader, you sacrifice cats, you do all this stuff. And then you figure, oh, man, I'm getting out of here. But that's not my nature. You know, I just will say, doggone it, I'm going to hang on to this thing until I'm either dead hanging on or I make the point. And, I, and I, unfortunately, sometimes in a negative way, I do the same thing, Joan can tell you. Sometimes, I sulk. <laughs> Hard to believe, it's true. I know that I'm wrong. I know what I've done is a terrible mess. I know I've screwed something up, but I am not going to admit nothing. <laughs> I'm going to hang on to this insanity that I've got cooked up until I get somebody to apologize to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the way it is. And I hear you laughing and giggling, and I see some of you with a sly smile saying, yeah, I know exactly what you mean, because I do the same thing. But what happens if the crab will let go of 
his emotions, his stubbornness, his flesh, his physical desire. What happens if suddenly, you ever see that crab, you know? We were in the <laughs> Chinese restaurant over with Bob and Ray a couple of weeks ago. I don't know, somebody I believe was there. They brought a live crab out, you know? And the crab grabbed onto the spoon and, and was just hanging on tight, wouldn't let go. Say, This is the case of Christianity today. I mean, here they say Jesus Christ is coming back to be seen, Bill. That's the basis of, that's the foundation of the religion, the second coming of Jesus Christ to be seen. And Jesus Christ in Luke 17, 20 says, oh, wait a minute. The kingdom comes not with observation. It's in you. Why don't they let go of their tradition and say, hey, wait a minute. We screwed it up. We didn't pay attention to the guy that's leading this thing. He's saying, no, that's not the way I'm coming back. I'm coming back inside of you because the kingdom does not come with observation. Luke 17, 20. See? That's the foundation of the whole operation. And, of course, the second foundation is this tithing business, which, of course, the Apostle Paul spends the whole chapter saying, don't do it. But they can't let go. But if they would let go, see, then they'd be off your back, out of your wallet. Oh, sure, a lot of the big cathedrals would come crumbling down, and they'd have to come into basements and do it. But all of a sudden, they would have a, a real Christ-centered Buddha-centered, Krishna-centered, oneness-centered, God-centered world. They can't do it. They have to hold on. You know, it's an awfully tough thing to break your traditions or to give up on your ego. Once you've committed yourself to something, you know what it's like to say, I've changed my mind. This isn't right. That's what has to be done. You see, you go back to this here, this control, this northern ass and southern ass. What is the northern ass? The northern ass is the stubbornness that comes out of your emotions. What is the southern ass? The southern ass is the stubbornness that comes out of your physical body. The physical desires of the southern ass, the emotional desires of the northern ass. What has to happen? Take a look at it. Page 102 in your little Bibles in the book of John. And I'll show you what has to, what has to happen. Go to John chapter 12, page 102. John chapter 12. Incidentally, if any of you want Sunday morning's uh, message that we did last Sunday morning, it's listed under the title of The Golden Screwdriver. That was such a good deal, I couldn't, I couldn't help but say that we, we got to call it The Golden Screwdriver. Uh -huh. John 12, chapter 14. This is what has to happen to the northern ass and the southern ass. Chapter 12, verse 14, and Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat there on as it is written. You know what happens there? That means the Christ nature within you gets hold of your stubborn nature and starts to control your stubborn nature and leads that stubborn nature through the gates of the heavenly Jerusalem. That means in terms that maybe we can deal with a little more stringently, that means that when we lift our consciousness above the thoughts of the mind, the higher divine realm of consciousness where there are no thoughts takes us to the right hemisphere where there is God consciousness, Christ consciousness in the right hemisphere of the brain. So the stubborn nature has to be sat upon by the Christ. The stubborn nature has to be controlled by the Christ means your carnal nature, my carnal nature, all of that insanity that we go through through the mind has to give way to that which is the controlling factor of the right hemisphere of the brain. And what happens, and you'll notice something. Notice it was a young ass. Remember in, in Matthew, there was a, 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 an ass and the fall of an ass? The reason for that was, is that older ass is that a stubborn nature that has to be subdued and controlled, but it's showing there is a fall of an ass, meaning there is something new born out of the old way. Out of the old stubborn nature that says, I'm going to have my way, voila, there is a new life born out of it. A new life born, a new life, something has conceived. Out of the old has come something new. And both of them are taken by Christ into heavenly Jerusalem. And it's all consciousness. It doesn't happen in a church. It doesn't happen in a Bible. It doesn't happen with a track. It doesn't happen with a stained glass window. There is no hymns. There's no rosary breeze. There's no holy water. There is no laying hands on anything. It happens when you sit still, enter within yourself, and climb up to the heavenly Jerusalem, heading up to the upper room, sitting there with Christ, dwelling within you. It happens within yourself. That's exactly why Jesus Christ said, the kingdom of God is within you. Look at John 12, verse 14. He sat on the ass and he says, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Okay? Daughter always means the desires of your emotions. 
The offspring of your emotions is daughter. The offspring of your human spirit is daughter. Daughter of Zion, it means fear not that spirit of God within. Behold, your king comes sitting on an ass's colt. In other words, I am controlling the stubbornness with the new life that has grown out of you, with the new life which will now suddenly manifest within you. Your king has come. Christ consciousness will now dominate within you because he has control of the stubborn nature, and he will take you into the heavenly Jerusalem, which is the right hemisphere of the brain. All of this stuff is symbolic language to say to you that when you meditate, you raise the energies to the pineal, it opens up the right hemisphere of the brain, and you are then able to enter into the right hemisphere brain cells come alive that you never used before and though the troubles may come against you have not changed your reaction to them will change totally if you do this your life will change it doesn't make any difference whether you believe it your life will change for the better your life will improve it will improve there is proof in this what is the proof of Christianity when you die you'll go to heaven what a deal. What a deal. Who comes back? Who's t who, how do you know? But this, this, is, this doesn't depend on you to, to, to die physically. This says if you do this, this good heavenly thing will happen right here now. This will prove it. You know what Buddha said? Buddha said, if you get into a religion, what you need is some kind of a document. You've got your Bible. He says, you've got to be able to understand that document. That's understanding mysticism. You're learning that. He says, once then you understand it and you put it to practice, if it doesn't work, chuck it, get rid of it. If you continue to live in poverty and bedlam and all kinds of hell while you're running around following this religion, it's a fraud. It's a fraud. But if you practice what Jesus Christ said and enter within yourself, go to the higher consciousness, the upper room, this will work and this will deliver you and this will set you free. Let's go to the first decon. There's three decons in every sign. And that's the same where the word came from, deacon, in the church. The three deacons are 10 degrees each. That's 30 degrees. And times 12 signs is 360 degrees in the zodiacal circle. The first decon is Ursa Minor, the little bear. You see the little bear? Ursa Minor, the little bear. Don't worry about the bear. No bear ever had a tail like that one. Take a look at the tail on that bear. Okay, you never going to see no bear with a tail like that. But in Chaldea, in Egypt, and Persia, it was not a bear. It was known as the lesser sheepfold, the smaller sheepfold. Somewhere along the line, it became a bear, and I'll show you why it became a bear. But whoever decided to put that tail on that bear knew nothing about bears, okay? The smaller bear is going to do fine for us, okay? Ursa Minor, the smaller bear. In the tail of this decon is the most important, wondrous star. Look at it. It is the mysterious polar star. It is the central star of the heavens around which all of the others rotate. This is great. See? Where is it taken to? Why is it there? Why does it happen like that? Why is there a star that all of the other stars revolve around? The very center, to be centered. And I'll show you a little bit about that. But that's a, that's a magnificent thing, and it's a beautiful thing. So here then we have, um, well, if you look at the third uh, decon, you'll see that we have two decons, Ursa Minor, the lesser, and look at the big bear in the next one. You see, take a look at this one. Here's the little bear, Paul. Can you get the little bear? That's Ursa Minor. Got that? Okay, and let's take a look at Papa Bear. There's Ursa Major, the big bear. The big bear, okay? So we have two bears, two bears, Ursa Minor, and both of them actually mean the lesser sheepfold and the greater sheepfold. Jesus Christ talked about it as the multitudes, the greater, the big bear, and the disciples, the little bear. Watch, I'll show you, okay? Where did the word, the bear, come from, the lesser sheepfold? In Hebrew, a word that means a herd or a fold of animals is this, D-O-H-V-E-R. Okay, that means a herd or a fold of animals like a sheepfold. But also in Hebrew, if you take the E-R off, D-O-H-V means bear. Bear. So you see what happened? Actually, that sign was of a sheepfold, a lesser sheepfold and a greater sheepfold, and the word was Dover, 
but when you take that Dover, you take the ER off, it became dope, and it means a bear. So someone, all of a sudden, a bear appeared. Okay, that's where it came from. In Arabic, it's dub, it's Persian, it's dab. So it's a flock, a fold, a herd, a two bears, lesser and greater. In the lesser, uh, that we're looking at the little one, okay, the polar, st uh, the polar star in the tail is al rukaba, which means turned on or ridden on. Turned on or ridden on, controlled, okay? That's like we were just talking about where Jesus Christ would, would come and, and sit upon that, which is the, the ass, the, and, and control it, take it into that place, which is the, the heavenly place. It is the central star. It does not revolve in a circle as does every other star. It stays right in the center. It's almost like the axis. Now, this is interesting. Watch this. This is interesting. This is your change, and this is why it's there. At one time in the universe, the polar star was in the constellation Graco, the dragon. Okay? Now, it is no longer in Graco, the dragon. It is centered in the lesser fold. It is centered in you. You and I are of the lesser fold. See? The se that where, what that means is, this is what it means. At one time, everything in your life was centered on yourself. <coughs> everything in your life was centered on what you could get. Everything in your life was centered on the system. Everything in your life was centered on religion. Everything in your life was centered on everything other than what true centering is, on the true nature of that, which is the universal cosmic presence within. Now, the polar star is no longer centered. It is centered in the divine self, which is within you. And everything revolves around that. So you're no longer interested, see, the primary cause of your life is no longer to find if you can do this, if you can do that, if you do this, you don't. It is to find the center. And the center is no longer the evil part, Draco. The center is now the divine part, Christ. That's why the universe at one time, the polar star, was centered in Draco. Now it no longer is. Or you're going to sit here and think that everything that happens up in the heavens is a mistake or it's just an accident. It's not. Everything is done with a very finely divine law. The, the, the universe, you can, you can map the... You, let me tell you something. You could take this Bible, you could take this Bible, and you could go get another one, and the two of them don't say the same thing. And get another one, and the three of them don't say the same thing. But do you know what? That universe, that celestial heavenly universe, has always been exactly the same. You can trace its history from the beginning to the end. It's not subject to any interpretation. It's there. It always has been. This has been changed by the hand of men. And so if you want to talk about the Word of God, what's it say? Look up. If you want to get, close your Bible and get a telescope and take a look at the Word of God. Created beautifully created to tell the stories that we're showing you right now. The polar is the axis around which everything else revolves. It's the center. It's being centered. It is allowing all else to revolve around. When you come into meditation, you kick off your shoes, you sit on this floor, you get here on a Tuesday night, 50, 60 people in here, and it's ohm, and all of this stuff going on, you are centered, and everything is revolving around you. The world is revolving around you, but you were centered. You were right there in the polar star because you have taken it out of the tail of Draco and put it into the center of the divine place where God dwells. Okay? In meditation, we touch the center. We touch the polar star. We lose the ego. We become one with the lesser, and we are lifted up. So the polar star is no longer in Draco, the lower mind. It's in Ursa Minor. And those who in meditation reject the lower mind then enter to the center. The star, if you look at it, is a star, Koshab, K-O-C-H-A-B, means waiting upon him who comes. Again in the center, where we are lifted up, we are waiting upon him who comes. I mean, it's there. Don't you see? In this little star, in this little constellation, is a star that is the center of the universe. And what does the star right next to it say? Waiting on him who who comes? Where does he come? To the center. To the center. All right? Decon number two, the great bear. Big bear. The brightest star, if you see it up in the shoulder there, is Dubai, D-U-B-H-E, which means flock. 
And the star below it, Marash, M-E-R-A-C-H, also means flock. There's a star to the left, which is Feda, which means she-goat. And a she-goat is the emotions. The emotions. Once again, the emotions or the desires. Now, I want you to see in the tail of this bear, you'll find a star called Mizar, M-I-Z-A-R, which means small. Okay? And you'll find another star, which is Alcor, A-L-C-O-R, which means the lamb. Okay? The lamb. Now, here we go. And I've been through with this with you before, but I want you really to take a look at this, and let's go at it again and really, really see it closely now. In the end of the tail of this bear is a star called El Seid, A-L-C-A-I-D. See it? It means daughters of the assembly. Okay? Daughters of the assembly. Now, look at the star in the right foot. Do you see it? At the paw? Talitha. You see that? Talitha. Okay, the daughter. This is the large assembly. This is the masses. This isn't, this isn't the, the small group. The world is narrow and few there are who find it. This is the multitude. The flock guarded by the universal presence which rates the right to guard. This is the human emotions. Now this becomes very interesting, and I, wanna, I want you to go along with me. Alcor, in the tale, the lamb is the Christ, okay? The inner consciousness of God. It is with the daughters. The, the, the daughters of the assembly are your desires. What's the assembly? Okay, you say, oh, there's the assemblies of God, uh, there's synagogues, there's temples, there's churches. It all means the same thing. It means the assembly. It means the temple. Here it is right here. That's the assembly, the temple. And what assembles in there? All of your desires, all of your thoughts, all of your emotions. Okay. And all of your emotions and all of your desires and all of your feelings have daughters. In other words, things are born out of those emotions that get you into trouble. I can, you know, I'm sure if I was to say something, can you remember some time when you became very emotional and, you know, you, you blew it? That means you, you gave birth. The emotions that were raging inside of your head gave birth. But you have to understand something. This is why you, you can't swallow all of this garbage. I was talking on television about homosexuals uh, last night. So how dare you point a finger, you crud? How dare you point a finger at any human being? What right do you have a point of finger? Oh, there's some homosexuals, they're sinning. You stupid fool because you know nothing about the endocrine system. You know nothing about the glandular system. You know nothing about the human mind. You know nothing about the human brain. And you point a finger because you're taking the Bible literally and the Apostle Paul said, be not a minister of the letter. How do you know when somebody's glandular system is working in a way differently than yours, it affects their personality, it affects their sexual life, and how dare you stand and point a finger at anybody? These people who with their so-called black collars on will point a finger at and jump over the fence as soon as church is over and run to the nearest whorehouse. And don't think they don't, because they do. What right does anybody have to point a finger? Jesus Christ said, judge not. And the reason he said, judge not, is because when those things happen inside of the glands, and they happen in the endocrines, and they happen in all the various aspects of the body, things happen to people in their personalities. There are people who are born with male this and female that and all kinds of screwy things. What right does anybody have to point a finger at? But they're fear peddlers, they're guilt peddlers. They have no right to do that. And you should take them to task when they do do it. And when they sit on television and point fingers at homosexuals, turn the blasted thing off. Because they're the ones that are sick. And they're the ones that have the fingers pointed at them. And I'm not championing anything. I am saying people do not line up and say, I'll have a homosexual drive or I'll have a heterosexual drive. It is governed by the various types of glands and things in the human body. And they've changed and one is stronger than the other and you don't, it's a very complex thing. But all of this religious fear that points fingers at people is sick, it is evil, and it is sin, and it comes right out of the church and it comes right out of the pulpit. does. But this daughters of the assembly, which is basically what it's talking about here, desires, 
And then in the right side of that bear, at the foot, Talitha. Go to page 38 in your little Bible. Look at Mark. Look at Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And go to verse 22. And behold, there comes one of the rulers of the synagogue. There you go. That's the assembly. One of the rulers of the synagogue comes to Jesus. This is the synagogue. Forget this man. Forget the story. You're not reading a storybook. You've got a Bible in your hand. It means it's spiritual. It means it's true. It means it's mystical. Forget about it. It's not telling you any stories. It doesn't have time to tell you stories. It's telling you about yourself. One part of your mind, the ruling aspect of your mind, comes to Jesus. Finally, when you come in here and hit the floor, and what do you say to Jesus in Matthew 5, uh, Mark 5, 22? You say, my daughter, verse 23, my little daughter lies at the point of death. One of the daughters of the assembly is dying. Your spirit is dying. Your emotions are dying. You're, you're just, inside of you is dying. But the ruler of the assembly, your mind, brings you to the Christ within you because a part of you, which is your desires, your emotions, your spirit is dying. That's what that means. If there's nothing about a story like you read in there, the spiritual story. The Apostle Paul told all these people, don't take this stuff literally. You know what he was talking about? What happens? I want you to look again at that bear. My daughter lies at the point of death, the spirit nature. Look again at the tail, Alcard, the daughters of the assembly. Look again at that right foot, Talitha. Now we're at Mark 5. I want you to see Jesus comes into the house. That means when you open that door, the Christ consciousness enters deep within you. It's in, all of this is happening inside of your head. The Christ consciousness enters into you, and in Matthew 5, 41, took the damsel by the head, and look at that star in the right foot. Hold that in your hand. Hold that in your hand. Take a look at that star in the right foot of that bear, would you please? Take a look at it. And in Matthew 5, 41, and he took her by the hand, and he said unto her, Talitha. Talitha kumi, daughter, rise. Your head is sick. There's something deep within you that's dying. And so you come to Jesus. You're pleading. And he comes inside of the house. And at the right side, where that star sits, he comes and he says, Talitha. In other words, what you have to do is let your spirit Rise up. Talitha, kill me. Rise up, daughter. You'll be well. Don't stay down where you are, little girl. Rise up. Talitha. Talitha. Who put it in the right side? Of the bear. Excuse me. Wait a minute. No, so you, no, so you can be heard. I'm sure. uh, just the location in the bear, assuming the bear is a metaphor, mm -hmm. the, it's, she would be in the claws of the bear anyway, which could also be interpreted as a point of death. Yeah, the claws of the bear. Okay, good. And that's the way you've got to see things, exactly. That's the way each one of you have got to see that. You've got to look at it. You've got to read it. You've got a guidance where to go with it. And now allow the spirit to teach you. And, 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 and Donna's already hit on one. She's at the claws of the bear. She's at the point of death. Okay, let's go to the last decon. It's not Arco, incidentally. It's Argo. A-R-G-O. The ship. This here constellation was the... Um, source of a great myth and mythology, Jason and the Argonauts. I don't know if you've ever read about that, and the Golden Fleece and all that kind of stuff. Jason sailed the ship Argo to gather in the Golden Fleece. You know? Argo is the ship which carries the risen soul to heaven. It is the origin of the word ark. Noah's Argo. Noah's ark, where the word comes from. And this is a ship, a ship, as I said, out of mythology of Jason who took the golden fleece from the serpent. See, you did too. Because when you centered, you took the polar star away from Draco, 
and placed it where it belonged, at the center of divine nirvana, so that all of this other garbage outside could revolve around you, but not involve you. Huh? The serpent who guarded the treasure could not be approached. There was no way to get to the serpent. No way you could do it, Don, no matter which way you came. The serpent would grab you. Rah, grab you. But Jason sailed Argo, and when he sailed Argo, the light gave him the ability to take the fleece. There was a great light on Argo, and it gave him the ability to take the fleece. The constellation is immense. And you know what it means? Argo means the company of travelers. The company of travelers. I'm rising up. I'm moving on. I'm sailing my ship. I'm carrying myself up into a whole different realm of life. The brightest star is in the keel. And see at the end of the oar, it's called Kenopus. It means the...